in our mission to get through the book of Genesis in this millennium, I'm going to move on and we're going to talk about some heinous, terrible, crazy things about Sarai and Hagar in chapter 16. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, you can uh, put your seatbelts on. It's definitely PG-13. We've been going through the life of Abraham in the scriptures. It begins in chapter 12 with Abram being called. And then once he gets called and he tells him to go out, uh, and he finally reaches his destination, there's a famine and he runs away. He goes to Egypt and takes all of his stuff, lies about his wife, and says, you know, this is my sister. Please don't hurt me. Uh, negotiate with me. And uh, maybe she could be yours. And he ends up with a bunch of stuff, and then they find out that God's unhappy about all of this. And uh, they get busted, and he leaves Egypt with lots of things, including some slaves and people and camels and donkeys, and the list goes on. And he becomes a very wealthy man. Moving on from there, his nephew has been attached to him, and he finally launches. He finally goes off because the Lord caused this friction between them because they just had too much stuff in one place. You might have this problem. Too much stuff in one place, and they couldn't share the fields and the flocks and everything, and their workers were all fighting. And so Abram very graciously said to his nephew, if you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. And Lot saw this well-watered valley near Sodom, and he goes, ooh, that, that looks good. I think I'm going to go there. And based upon what he sees with his eyes, the lust of the eyes, he goes to where he thinks is the optimal place for him to be, paradise on earth. And we know that it doesn't quite turn out that way because there's a war and there are these four kings against five kings and they come and they go down south and they make a sweep and they take all their stuff, destroy all their land and take their people and their property, their mates, their children, and they start to go away. Abram hears of this. He takes 318 of his own warriors that he has in his own household. That's a pretty good, strong defense in his house he has. And they catch up with them and take everything back and bring it back. We're introduced to the king of Sodom who's trying to give him stuff. And he says, I don't want a thing from you. And he meets Melchizedek, this incredible character who is a foreshadowing of Christ, who is a priest and the king of Salem, and how he looks a lot like Jesus and does a lot of things that are kind of uh, in, in the footprint of Jesus before Jesus shows up. And so we, we talked about Melchizedek. Last week, we talked about Abram cutting a covenant. And uh, you and I might not know these ways of people making a covenant. You and I find a lawyer and we sign papers. And that's how you make a covenant with somebody. And it's something that's uh, legally enforced and it's enacted with uh, circumstances and consequences if you don't fulfill. But this was a little bit different because God was the one that actually goes through these pieces. You know, remember, he says, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a child in your old age. And he goes, well, how can I be sure of this? And maybe you appreciate his wondering whether God really spoke to him or not. And he says, okay, no problem. Get me a three-year-old heifer. Get me a three-year-old uh, goat and a, and a ram and get me a pigeon and a, and a dove. It's an interesting recipe. I just want you to notice they're all three years old, all of the larger mammals. So whenever you see the three, make sure you go. Hmm. And so get me all of these and make them, make them up as a sacrifice. And this is how you cut a covenant. And the people that usually would make this covenant walk through the pieces and say, if I don't fulfill my end, may I be like these animals. So it's a, it's a pretty dramatic thing. And this is all done in the full view of God. But God is cutting a covenant with Abram, but Abram does all of this. He stays up late at night and he defends all the pieces. And we know the birds of the air come and try to peck at it and pull it away before the Lord shows up to do this ceremony. And it's been a long day. Abram eventually falls asleep and the Lord speaks to him and he sees the Lord walk through these pieces with a torch and an oven. And you go, wow, that's kind of interesting. And we talked about all that last week and how the, that's a picture of the people of God and how they would be tested and purified in the wilderness, which he tells him in advance is going to happen. And God's presence always through fire and smoke. And so we talked a little bit about that last week. This week, 
We're going to talk about infidelity. Scheduled, planned, encouraged by the wife. Well, it's not different than modern psychology, which they say, actually, if you have an affair, it can actually build your marriage. Yeah, that's what they say. Although 50% of Americans that ended up in a divorce will tell you otherwise. Be careful what you ask for. That's what I'm going to uh, subtitle this one to be. Be careful what you ask for. Because sometimes we think we need to give God a hand in doing what he needs to do. Now, I know none of you ever have this problem. But, you know, maybe God needs me to help him to fulfill his will, what he said he would do. Now, the big thing all along with Abram is you are going to be this mighty father of this great nation, the multitude of stars. If you can count those, then you'll be able to count your, your offspring. And the dust of the ground. If you can count the dust, then you can count your offspring. And the sand. And if you can count the sand, he tells him over and over and over he's going to give him a son. Abram's in his 70s now and is kind of wondering. And his wife is in her 60s. So he's beginning to wonder what's going on here. And so they're in Canaan for a good 10 years. And he's wondering, is God really going to do what he promised? How many of you have ever been there? Mm -hmm. Only a few of you. Wow. <coughs> I can tell you everything God says he does. Amen. If you think he said something and it didn't happen, it's because he didn't say it. It's always the case. <coughs> Let's pick it up from verse 1 in chapter 16. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. And so Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, and perhaps I shall obtain children by her. What? You know, we just read through this stuff and say, yeah, sure, sure, I read this story before. But what? The funny thing is, this was actually one way that you could become a surrogate mother or the way you could adopt a child. You can father a child and yet not have the mother. And it would become Abram and Sarai's child. And so it's a way of kind of surrogacy, which is bizarre because, you know, we use test tubes and, and other things. Uh, we don't actually do it in a bedroom. We do it in a laboratory. But it's a rather interesting thing. And you got to wonder, what? <laughs> if my wife said, listen, I'm old and I know you like kids. <laughs> and she selects one of you fine ladies <laughs> and says, why don't you... You know, inseminate. What? <laughs> now, you know that's trouble, right? You know that's trouble. I would think, oh, okay, you, you're trying to test me. I get it. You want to see if I really love you. That's what it is. I mean, I, you can't make this up. This is, this is the Bible, which shows it's not written by human beings because this wouldn't be in here. But God wants you to know that everybody's messed up from top to bottom, you and me included. So God helps those who help themselves. I do not have the verse in the chapter because it doesn't exist. God helps those who help themselves. It was not said by anyone in the Bible. It was actually said by Benjamin Franklin. So whoever you said Benjamin Franklin, you win. God helps those who help themselves. Well, not according to this story, and not according to your story or my story either. Helping God to do something that he, he can do alone, not a good idea. And so they try to figure this out. Hagar is an Egyptian maidservant to Sarai, and she is a reward of his compromise. If you remember when he went into Egypt and he lied and said, this is my sister, he was given all this stuff, kind of like a dowry, by Pharaoh, who said, your, your wife is looking good to me. Let, bring her into my household and see how she gets along with the rest of my wives and my family. 
and uh, you know, I'll consider taking her. And while you're thinking about it, here, here's a bunch of stuff. And one of those things was a woman named Hagar. She is the reward of his compromise. So I start to wonder, is there any reward for my compromise that's in my life that might take me further down a rabbit hole? So I think we have to have compassion on Sarah. We don't understand what it's like to not have children, perhaps. Some of us may. In this culture, it was a deeply disturbing thing. It meant that God was mad at you. At least that was public opinion. God is angry with you and is punishing you and, or else you'd be fruitful because that's what you're supposed to do, all right? <coughs> so her motivation is she might feel guilty, like there's something wrong with me, not just physically but spiritually. God might be against me. And that always goes on in, in the back of your head, right? When, when things don't go your way or the way that you think they should or even the way that God said they should, and you say, well, maybe it's me. You know, it's not a bad place to check, but when the Lord speaks, you better believe him. Because very often we start feeling like it's me, it's me, it's me, and it's not you. And you're spending a lot of attention on yourself. It can become a narcissistic preoccupation. It can bring guilt. She might have shame. That's usually what's in front of other people. So other people are pointing their finger at her and saying, Sarah, I, yeah, and Abram, you know, he saw this, God spoke to him and said he's going to have a son in his old age. And I guess, uh, you know, it's Sarah. And so, she, you know, she's got the eyes of people looking at her and wondering maybe what's wrong with her. So it's not just in herself, it's also outside herself. It brings depression when the heart becomes sick, when it anticipates something that just doesn't occur, you know, like all of the videos of the kids that think they're getting a brand new Xbox or something because the box says Xbox and they open it up and it's like underwear. <laughs> it's all over the internet, these kids with their disappointment. And some of them don't know how to react and so they just go. And then there are some of them that scream and yell and throw things. Both are acceptable. But imagine having this anticipation and thinking, God told you something, and it didn't happen. That can lead to depression, right? Think about where she's at. She's a bit disillusioned. Just to, did God say, really say this thing or not? Have you ever questioned whether God really said something or not? Yeah. I believed when I was young that God called me to be a pastor. It didn't happen until I was 50. I can tell you, I have a lot of years feeling like Sarah. Did God really say this? Is he really going to do this in my old age? And a deep distrust in God and his character. You know, there are lots of people that I have met who say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian and I believe in Jesus and all that. And I say, well, what church do you go to? Oh, I don't go to church anymore. And there's usually a wound. There's a misunderstanding of something that God spoke to them or told them or something they've been through that didn't occur the way they thought. And so they said, that's it. I'm not going back to church. It's a little like having a bad meal and saying, I'm not going to eat anymore. It's ridiculous. But people say those things. And suddenly there's this distrust of God because God said he was going to do something and didn't do it. And ultimately, you start to not trust God. You start to get suspicious of God. So I want us to have compassion on Sarai and appreciate her position because I think most of us can kind of relate to that if you have a relationship with the Lord. So she's thinking, well, we'll just do what all the people do. This is what people do. This is what society does, you know, and suddenly adopts this adoption thing with her maid. And to you and I, it sounds bizarre. But back then, it was an accepted practice. Not in the scriptures, because when God created Adam, he created Eve. He created one man and one woman for life. That's what God created. Nothing outside of that. God permits it, God uses it, but God does not intend that. And I say that for any of you who are saying, hey, the Bible's a good example for me. I should do this. Don't do this, you'll be in deep trouble. 
with me. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. And then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. By the way, you never get a wife from your wife. <laughs> Regardless of what the Mormons tell you, you don't get a wife from your wife. After Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, so this has been 10 years they're waiting for God to fulfill his vow. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. Boom, just like that. Does that sound like a blessing from God? Hey, we've been waiting and waiting and trying to do it this, this way. Perhaps I need to help God and go this way. Oh, look, it worked. That's like walking into a casino with one quarter and hitting the, hitting the lever and winning. If you could stop right there, that'd be great. But what ends up happening is you tend to say, I could do that again. Is that a blessing or a curse? Two good reasons not to listen to your wife. <laughs> I noticed that the men reluctantly laugh. And the, and the women were belly laughing, yes. Two good reasons not to listen to your wife. One is the case of Adam. His wife was telling him to do something God said, do not do. That's a good reason not to listen to your wife. And the second is to violate your marriage covenant. Those are two good reasons why you don't listen to your wife. If it violates God or if it violates your marriage. It was quiet that day. Two good reasons not to listen to your wife. Be careful what you ask for because you may get it. Sarai said, here's a great idea. And pushes this handmaiden on him and say, yeah, inseminate. Which I, I would just have trouble with that whole command. <laughs> so what are his possible motivations for saying yes? It could be. And I can tell you at the bottom line for both of them, it's because they don't believe God. They don't believe God. Or they may have some mental assent and knowledge that God said something, but they really in their hearts don't believe. And God made it very clear several times, right? And so they try to rewrite, maybe they heard it wrong. And it's amazing, it's Sarai's idea, but Abram goes along with it. Wow, that sounds just like the Garden of Eden again. Here, Eve goes up and takes of this, and it was desirable. You know, it, it was a good-looking piece of fruit. It was desirable to make one wise. And she took and she ate and she gave to her husband who was with her. It's the same situation. That's why I say there's two reasons not to listen to your wife. In 2 Peter 3, 8, 9, it says, So, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, we think God's kind of dragging his heels with the second coming. We think God may be dragging his heels with fulfilling a promise that he made to you. He's not slack. He has perfect timing. We're the ones that get all messed up with it. It's not that he's lazy. He has plans that you don't know about. And here they are, 10 years in the land of Canaan, and nothing seems to be happening. They're in their 70s and 60s, and maybe I need to make this happen on my own. Because Abram's got a deep desire to have an heir. You remember God said, hey, I'm going to bless you. You did a great job. Thanks for delivering all these people back. He goes, huh, what are you going to give me? I don't have an heir. You see, he's got a deep desire to have children to have somebody who can handle all this stuff too. And he just didn't have it. And that can be a deep wound. Enough that maybe you try to force something that God didn't say to do. And when she saw that she had conceived, her, mitre, her mistress became despised in her eyes. And then Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. I gave you my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, 
I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. I, I tell you what, if I was Abram, I'd say it wasn't my idea. <laughs> this was all your idea. Notice the way she's speaking of it now. I have given you my maidservant. She sounds like she's doing him a favor into your embrace. <laughs> you notice the jealousy that's just seething from her now? Because guess what? One time, bam, boom, she's pregnant. Now suddenly she's elevated among all the staff. She's now elevated even above Sarai. And so once a slave, now a queen in her own mind, is now looking down on Sarai because God apparently finds me a better vessel than you. And now she's stepping out of her place. And Sarai snaps and she blames him. It's all your fault. Sounds so familiar. <laughs> the Lord comes to Adam. Adam, what did you do? The woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit. And then I ate. He, he, he takes responsibility in the last section. Ask the woman, woman, what is this that you have done? The serpent deceived me and I ate. No, serpent didn't have an excuse. God didn't let him speak. We tend to blame other people for our own mistakes, and we tend to be very reluctant to take responsibility. What a beautiful and Christ-like thing it is to see someone take responsibility for themselves and not try to assess blame to anybody else. You know, that's what a real apology is. A real apology is when you take responsibility for everything you've done, and you don't say, but, you know what that's like? Well, I was wrong, but you. And now you go on forever, you know. That tends to be our fleshly nature, isn't it? Don't, don't act like that. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> so she saw that she conceived, and they're going about their business, but now Sarai is despised in her eyes. She's looking down on who basically is her owner, because she's an employee. And so she's looking at Sarah with that eye, you know, with that, you know. And it's bad enough that she's dealing with this whole insecurity to the point where she volunteers her husband to procreate with somebody else. But now something has changed. That's why I say, be careful what you ask for because you may get it. And now that she's got it, she doesn't want it. You know how that is? Oh, if I only did this, or I only, if only I had a new car, and then you get a new car, and it's a stinking lemon, and everything goes wrong with it, and you're like, I wish I had my old car back. None of you know what that's like. Okay. I know what that's like. And so Abram said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her presence. Gentlemen, I want you to notice the incredible leadership that Abram affords here. <laughs> it's not my problem. You deal with it. That's not leadership. He should have taken charge, right? He should have resolved this issue. Number one, he didn't defend himself. I think he was feeling pretty guilty. But number two, you, got, you two girls got a problem. We need to sit down and talk this out. Not deal with it. <laughs> it's not my problem. It's a woman thing. There's no leadership in that. Shame on you, Abram. And shame on us when we delegate to other people the difficult things and we don't take them upon ourselves. It's not a good example. And so... There's this bitterness between the two of them, and she treats her harshly. Now, you know, Sarai's, she unloads into Hagar, and the original language says that she abuses her in some way. It could have been verbal or physical, we're not sure. But here's a woman bearing a child that will be yours to be adopted, and you're now abusing her 
because you're jealous of the relationship she has with her husband and you feel insecure about you. It's the Bible. It shows the real human beings that are involved in this. Amen. By the way, Sarai, just to remind you, her name means contentious. So she's certainly living up to this. And Hagar, her name means flight. Like, pew, I'm out of here. That's what her name means. I don't know if her name became that because of who she was or if that's who she was and she just lived up to her name. Either way, Hagar means flight. It means I'm out of here. And so how does Abram deal with this? He says, it's not my fault, not my problem. You deal with it. And how does Hagar deal with it? She gives up and runs away. How many of you prefer to avoid conflict? I'd like to see your hands. <laughs> I am not the only one. And yet by avoiding conflict, sometimes you cause a bigger problem. Yeah. And it's better to deal with face to face and get it done. And so she runs away. I'll learn to press the right button. Now, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by a spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? It sounds like he already knows the answer. She said, I am fleeing from the present presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Wow, that's really putting her in her place. You don't have a right to run away. Go deal with this thing. So Sarah is in the middle of the wilderness. Now, you may not appreciate where she is. It says that she's in a spring of water in the wilderness <coughs> near Shur. Shur is about halfway between Jerusalem and Egypt. So where's she going? She's going home. She's going back to Egypt where she's from. So she's running away. This, this place called Shur, it was called Shur because it means wall. And it was a bunch of forts that were actually built on the edge of Egypt so that they would be able to protect their land. And so it, it's, it, she's on her way to the, the gateway into her old land, into Egypt. And she doesn't get there. She stops at the spring of water. And we don't know if it's just a drink or if she's lingering there. Um, if she's, but she's pregnant, okay? She's on her own out in the wilderness. She's running home. She's going home to Egypt. Just so that you know, that's about where Shur is on the Sinai Peninsula. And if you go up here, this is about where Jerusalem is on the map. So she's on her way to Egypt and she's at a spring of water, which is over here. Who is the angel of the Lord? Notice the capital letters, which the translators have helped us to understand. The angel, angelos in the Greek, a messenger of Yahweh. The messenger of Yahweh. You go, well, who is that? Well, it's an angel. But it's the angel of the Lord. Hmm, interesting. The next verse helps us. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall be counted for multitude. They will not be counted for a multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand, his hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. It's rather interesting. I want you to notice a pronoun. I. Do angels have the ability to multiply descendants? No, they don't. They make announcements all the time. In fact, we have an announcement about Christmas that's coming, right? And notice the wording here. 
The angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. That sounds very familiar. And you shall call his name Jesus. Sounds very familiar. So there's this announcement, but the angel, the angel of the Lord is what's called a theophany. It's a pre-appearing of Jesus Christ before he was ever born. Because no one has ever seen God at any time. The scriptures are very clear about that. In John 1.18, it says, no one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. So Jesus is the, the only God that anyone will ever see. And I believe this is a pre-appearing of him because only God can do this. Not only that, but there are other things coming up. Ishmael means God hears. You will call him Ishmael because God hears. I love that. She's in the wilderness. She's all alone. She just left home. She's probably got nothing in her pockets. She's going back to Egypt. She's a slave. She's pregnant with some other guy, some other woman's husband's child. And God hears her in the middle of the wilderness and meets her by a well. God will meet you. Whatever wilderness it is that you find yourself in. And then there's this prophecy about all of these Arab nations. By the way, um, Ishmael becomes the father of all of these nations. In fact, there are 12 tribes, just like there are 12 tribes from his half-brother, uh, Isaac. So you're going to see there are, there are 12 tribes that come out of that line, and there are 12 tribes that come out of this line, which is rather interesting. It sounds only fair. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to bring out the prophecies the first thing is, he will be a wild man. Actually, the original says he will be a wild donkey. I'm using the preferred language. He's going to be stubborn, and he's going to be like a wild donkey out in the wilderness. And his hand shall be against all of his brethren. It's going to be against everyone, and everyone's going to be against him. That sounds like a lot of violence, right? Have you looked at the news recently? The only thing that the Arabs can agree on is that they hate Israel. And it's a shame because they're related. But when they're not against Israel, they're against each other. And they fight each other all the time. In fact, there is more Arab blood spilled by Arabs. <laughs> they, they shed their own brother's blood more than they shed the blood of any Israelite. So... And it says that he will dwell in the presence of his brother. In other words, nobody's shooting out. They're going to kind of all stay together and fight, like maybe your family does. <laughs> and then she called the name of the Lord. By the way, that word is Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, who spoke to her. So she identifies the angel of the Lord as the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. That's El Roy. That's God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who seen's me, who's seen me? She says, did I just see the God who sees me? I just saw the God who sees me. Whoa. Some other people who have met God face to face like this have, you know, fallen to the ground. Some people have met angels, fall to the ground. And like the angel in Revelation, he tells John, no, 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 no. You're misunderstanding. I'm just an angel. I'm just a messenger. Get up, get up. You can't bow at my feet and worship because angels don't get worship. But this one does. You're the God who sees. Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahairoi. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And so Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. What a coincidence. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. 
Now we know it's not going to be another 14 years until he has another child. But she goes back. This is the well of the one who lives and sees me. That's actually what beer, beer is a well, Lahauroi. This is the well of the one who lives and sees me. Hagar named it that because God met her there. I appreciate the fact that when we run away, God follows us. I don't like it when I'm running, but I like it when I eventually give up and I realize that there's still repentance to be had. There's still a relationship to be rekindled that God hasn't just given up on me and said, ah, forget it. He's a failure. Let, let him go. I'm done with him. God doesn't do that with us, does he? And God sees you just like he saw her. And I just so appreciate about the Lord. By the way, here's the well, which has been built up considerably since then, but it's in the middle of nowhere and it's on the way to shore and it's exactly between Kadesh. It's, it's all exactly where it is and it is the well of the one who lives and sees me. And so Hagar sees the God who sees her. As a Christian, as somebody who's given their lives to Jesus Christ, we're always making connection relationally with the God who sees us. And every once in a while, we get an opportunity to see him. And it doesn't matter what you're going through or where you are or what you're struggling with, whether it's a relationship issue or whether it's a financial issue or whether it's a job issue. God sees you. And just when you think you're sinking, just when you think it's all done, Jesus reaches down and he pulls you up like he did with Peter. It's one of my favorite pictures of Jesus walking on the water and pulling Peter up after Peter looks around and he goes, Lord, I'm sinking. You know, I can hear, you know. And that's what the Lord does for Hagar. Somebody who was involved, probably not even her fault, that she was involved in this. And he says, you need to go back and submit to Sarai because God has a plan. And he says, don't worry, I'm going to protect you and take care of you. And you're going to have this incredible nation that's going to come from you as well. Even in our messes, God works together for the good of those who love him and who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Aren't you glad for that? I'm so grateful for that. Next week, we're going to go through Genesis chapter 17, and we're going to talk about another PG-13 rated thing, which is circumcision. It's interesting that this happens after this other event, that there's a removal of flesh. So, and boy, we can really look forward to talking about that. <laughs> I'm going to ask the worship team to come up if they would. I don't know where each one of you is, but you might be in a place like Sarai and Abraham where you're just wondering if God's going to do what he said he would do. He always does what he says he's going to do. It just might not be on our timetable. There might be some things behind the scene that need to happen first. But I love the way that even when we're tested and even when we fail, that God meets us where we are. He's the God who sees you. He's the only one who knows what deep down you're struggling with. And he will be your deliverer. You can look to him. People, well-meaning good people, will let you down all the time. Jesus never will.